If you've been with us the last few weeks, we've been talking about 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. And what we did when we first started this, this sermon series, a series that's going to go on for a number of months, we always have a title for it. And we took the title for this entire series of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians from 1st Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, that says that the Lord will deliver us from the wrath that is to come. That God will deliver us from the wrath to come. And if you remember, what I said is that when we go through 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, remember that it's a prophetic book. The Apostle Paul, in his infinite wisdom and under the inspiration of God, decided to, to write to these brand new believers about the second coming of Christ, which should actually give us great hope and great encouragement because this book was written almost 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, and Paul was saying, be ready. Be on your guard because the Lord is going to come. The Lord is going to return for you. I got to tell you, this last week, Carol and I were gone, and we put our puppy, who's now a year old, so I guess he's no longer a puppy, but we put her at the kennel, best friend's kennel over by, by Disney. And dogs are amazing because whether you're gone for a day or a week, it's like they haven't seen you in years. You know, so we picked her up last night, and she was so excited to see us. And that's, that's the idea of returning. When the Lord comes back, we need to be excited. We need, that's something that we need to cheer about. It's something that Paul says in encouragement. Um, in, in, in the uh, epistles, Paul calls it the, the blessed hope. The blessed hope. So today's sermon, okay, today's sermon, I've taken it right from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I didn't have to look too hard to find out what the title of my sermon was, because right there in my Bible, it says, The Day of the Lord, okay? So and I know this is going to get some people a little bit nervous when we talk about the second coming, when we talk about the Day of the Lord. The Day of the Lord in the Bible is a, both a generic as well as a very specific term. In some ways, after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down and they started speaking in tongues and they came to preach the gospel, in some ways we are in the latter days. That started, that's what the Apostle Peter said, that we're in the latter days. This is exactly what Joel talked about in the latter days. So the latter days started 2,000 years ago. That's a very general term. At the same time, the, very, the Bible is also very specific about the day of the Lord, a time what we call of Jacob's trial. It's a time that Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Micah, a lot of the Old Testament prophets, as well as the book of Revelation describes to us. And it's a day of, of, of foreboding. It's a day that the Lord comes back and it's a time to get right with God or get lost. I mean, that's basically it. We know that God ultimately is going to judge the good and the evil. He's going to ju judge the righteous and the unrighteous. There's going to be a time of judgment. If there isn't a time of judgment, that means that God isn't fair. But God needs to be able to, to be truthful in his justice. And he needs to be able to punish the wicked as well as reward those that are his. And that period of time at the culmination of time is called the, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. So if you take a look at your notes, you may want to take a look at your notes a little bit more today than you normally do. Because I'm going to try to give you a little bit of, of background because we can read these 11 verses as you probably read them before. But the idea is that we have to understand prophecy. We have to understand what prophecy is and why there is prophecy. So let's just, let's get started. Let's just get started. Um, one of the things we're going to say is that the Bible itself gives us the reason for prophecy. 25% of the Bible is prophecy. One out of every four, four verses is prophecy. It's, we often think of the major prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel and Isaiah as, 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 prof, as prophets that gave us prophecy. But actually prophecy is all through the Bible as we're seeing it even in this epistle that Paul wrote. And um, Isaiah told us the purpose of prophecy. He says, remember, the Bible, the, the Lord says, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done. 
So the idea is this, is that the Lord is the only one that can truly tell us in advance the things that are going to happen. One of the things we could take a look at, if we open the Bible, we can take a look at the book of Genesis, for example. And the book of Genesis it says, in the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, how does anybody know that? If he's just creating the heavens and the earth, and it's not until later that he has Adam and Eve come along, how can we know what happened in the beginning? And the reason we know is because the Lord spoke to the prophets. And the, the prophets were able to speak under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And they were able to write down the beginning from the end. And if we take a look at prophecy, if we take a look at the prophecy in the Bible, we'll find that the prophecy has been fulfilled. More than three quarters of all the prophecy in the Bible, depending on how you count, has been fulfilled. And it was fulfilled just as it was prophesied. And sometimes it's only because we have a rearview mirror. We can look in the rearview mirror and we can see the things that happened to be able to understand how prophecy was fulfilled. And one of the things I, I like to mention is the whole idea of, of the coming of Jesus, of coming of this Messiah. The Bible, remember the, the wise men rode into Jerusalem, right? The wise men rode into Jerusalem and they said, where is this king of the Jews to be born? And the prophets and the scribes and the Pharisees all took a look and they said, ah, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says that it's in Bethlehem because it says Bethlehem, even though you're the smallest of all of the tribes and all of the villages, to you will be born the, the king, the king of Israel. So they said it's in Bethlehem and that we know the story that they went to Bethlehem. Well, the Bible also says, it says, out of Egypt I will call my son. And well, that, that would be difficult to understand. How could it be Bethlehem but out of Egypt? But we have the perspective of our rearview mirror. We know the story. We know that Herod was after Jesus and after the Holy Family. So they fled to Egypt until Herod had died and then they came back from, from Egypt. Out of Egypt I've called my son. It was fulfilled exactly as it was said. But wait, the Bible, the Bible also says that he will be called a Nazarene. Well, now, wait a minute. Now, that's a different place. How can, how can this person that was born in Bethlehem, that was called out of Egypt, also be called a Nazarene? Well, we know that the family moved to Nazareth. So in the retrospect, we can see prophecy exactly. However, today we're talking about the day of the Lord. This is something that hasn't happened yet. So as a result, we can speculate, we can take a look at the scriptures and try to understand and try to determine from the scriptures the best understanding we possibly could have of what that means. What is it gonna mean that the Lord comes back? And if you were with us just a couple weeks ago, remember Paul talked about this event this time when the dead in Christ will rise and then we that are alive will be caught up together with them to be with the Lord. And I said this teaching is an interesting teaching and for some people it's called the rapture of the church. But not everybody. Not everybody. And my wife, remember I told you about, my wife said to be sure to let, yet you know that. That there's many, many people, many great pastors, many great churches that don't teach that these are separate events. They don't teach that these things that we're talking about, we can figure out exactly. They take a look at the book of Revelation, for example, and we find that it's mainly, maybe for them, it's very allegorical. We're not quite sure exactly how this is all going to be fulfilled. Some people say, well, we can see some of these in everyday actions, meaning that it's kind of being fulfilled as we go along. Other people say, no, it's a specific event at some time in the future. As long as we're using the Bible as a guide, that's okay. So I'm going to teach you, is that okay? I'm going to teach you from my perspective what I believe the Bible teaches us about the day of the Lord. So let's talk about it a little bit. There's some keys to understanding the Bible. And one of them is what we call Bible literalism. And that means taking the Bible literally. Now we know that there's a lot of allegory, there's a lot of symbols, sometimes the devil is represented as a serpent, okay, we understand that. So there's some symbols that are in the Bibles, but often when we don't see an obvious symbol, when we don't know that it's exactly allegory, we want to take it as literally as possible. We know that uh, li Bible literalism uh, <laughs> goes hand in hand with what we know as the Bible as being inerrant and inspired. It's inerrant and it's inspired. It's the word of God and you can take it to the bank. It's profitable for teaching. That's what 2 Timothy says. Rather than saying you can take it to the bank, 2 Timothy says this. It says that all scripture is God breathed 
and it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Bible is teaching us, and it's, and it's profitable for teaching. So remember that when we say that the Bible, we can take it literally. Remember that Jesus, two of the most amazing events in the Old Testament, that many people say, well, I can believe the Bible, but some of these are things are just a little bit too, too far out. One of them is Jonah, right? I mean, can a man be swallowed by a large fish and survive? Well, the Bible says he could. Well, people say, well, that's got to be allegory. It's got to be symbol. It's got to mean something else. But Jesus himself said, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man. So shall the Son of Man. Jesus is comparing his death and resurrection to the story of Jonah. So Jesus didn't believe it was allegory. He didn't believe it was just something else. Adam and Eve, many people say, well, we don't know exactly how the earth began. Uh, the Bible talks about Adam and Eve, but a lot of us just don't believe there was a literal Adam and Eve. Well, Jesus did. Jesus is called the second Adam, okay? Jesus is called the second Adam. And just as the first Adam uh, of sinned, so the second Adam gives us salvation. So the Bible takes these things very literally. So Bible literalism is one of the keys. The second key is Israel. And this is hard to understand. You have to understand that through the ages, the church read the same scriptures that we read, and it talks about the... The, uh, the vine coming to bud and that uh, the flowers will bloom in Israel and that people will be regathered. And they take a look at this and they scratch their head and they say, you know, it's just a desert wasteland. And in fact, the Jews were the ones that crucified the Lord. Therefore, maybe the Lord has completely rejected Israel, okay? And when we read these scripture verses about people being regathered and the Lord coming back to Israel, maybe we have to understand that that's the church. Maybe that's the church. Well, that would be fine, but in 1948, in May of 1948, all of a sudden in a day, Israel is founded again. And wouldn't you know it that over the last couple hundred years, the teaching that has emerged that Israel has a separate prophetic destiny than the church. And this is a relatively new teaching. This is not a teaching for the last 17, 1800 years of church history. It's a relatively new teaching that the church has a separate destiny. And again, you have to understand that it would be very difficult sitting back in 500 to 600 AD saying, well, I read the Bible that the temple is going to be rebuilt and that Israel is going to be back again and the Lord is going to come back to the Mount of Olives and all these things are going to happen just as it's prophesied. But today, when you see the nation of Israel, and you see the nation of Israel surrounded by all these nations that hate Israel, and somehow it's still there and it happened, we start saying, you know what, I think it's very possible that we can take the Bible literally when it comes to Israel. I'll go one step further. This is not my quote, but it's in quotes because it's somebody else's quote, and I like it. It says, if we understand Israel's role in end time prophecy, we will understand Bible prophecy. If we fail to properly understand Israel, we will fail to fully understand end time prophecy. So Israel is a key. If you don't get Israel, you're not going to get the rest of prophecy because to, you're going to understand that it has to be allegorical. It has to mean something other than what it clearly says. Remember, we have literacy. We have to be able to take the Bible literal. And then the key is Israel. So let's go on. Why Israel? Well, number one, Israel is the center of geography in the Bible. So when the Bible says something about the kings of the north or the kings of the south, it's north and south of Israel, Jerusalem, not here. Like we were up north, okay? But we're not talking about Canada, okay? We're not talking about north of the United States or south of the United States. We're talking about Israel. So Israel is the center of geography. Secondly, the tribulation period, and I'm not going to talk about it too much, because I've only got 20 minutes anyway, I don't have enough time. But when we talk about the end times, when we talk about the end times, meaning that seven years of tribulation, and taking it literally, again, not allegorically, remember those times are called the days of Israel's, or Jacob's trial. And Jacob is also named Israel. This is a time set aside specifically to bring Israel to the Lord. The Apostle Paul tells us that all of Israel at some time in the future will be saved. All of Israel, outside. Third thing. Number three, the church is not Israel. I've kind of covered that already. The idea is that the church is not Israel. Israel is a separate entity. God has a plan for the church. God also has a plan for, for Israel. 
Finally, that Israel has a destiny yet to be fulfilled. When we take a look at unfulfilled prophecy, so much of it we can get from the book of Revelation. And it talks about a time, a very difficult time. You have seven, you have seven uh, seals, uh, seven trumpets, seven vials, all these things happening. And the center of all of that is in Israel. There's a certain destiny still for Israel that is yet unfulfilled. Okay, enough of that, enough of the background. Let's get into the actual scripture verses for today. So you can take a look on your notes and you'll see the day of the Lord and we're going to break it up into five or six different parts and we're going to kind of key into certain verses. Is that okay? Let's go for it. Let's go first of all verses one, two, and three. But concerning, this is Paul writing, concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you for you yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, woman, and they shall not escape. Now you see, one of the things we have to understand is that Paul had taught the Thessalonians about the day of the Lord. He had taught them about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we thought that was kind of amazing because as far as we know, he only spent a very short period of time, as short as maybe three or four weeks with these Thessalonians. They were brand new believers. And he's not only teaching them about the Lord and about the grace of the Lord and the Holy Spirit and that Jesus was the Messiah, but he then goes and tells them that Jesus is coming back again. And he tells them that they need to be ready. They need to be prepared for that. And he calls it the, the blessed hope. It's an encouragement for them. So these Thessalonians are already taught. That's why, Jesus, that's why Paul is saying, I don't need to tell you again. I don't need to tell you again about these things, okay? For you perfectly well know, which means he's told them before, that the, that the, um, that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Now, I think we kind of understand what that means. I mean, most of us, now when I grew up, even though I grew up in the suburbs, um, we didn't lock our door at night. Did you? I mean, we just didn't lock our door. I mean, some people did, we just didn't lock our door. It was not a big deal. In fact, I don't think our back door had a lock on it for a long time. And one of those little hooks that we would put on every now and then, but we didn't have a lock. But, but we would lock the doors now. So my wife and I locked the doors and the kids were growing up, we locked the doors, we turned the lights on. So we even had an alarm system at one time, put the alarm system on, right? But wouldn't you be surprised after locking the doors and putting on the lights that all of a sudden a thief would break in? That would be surprising, right? That's why it's called a thief in the night. Somebody comes at night and does something that's completely unexpected. So Paul is basically saying that this time people will be saying peace and safety. They will be saying peace and safety. And I'm using the they very specifically because it's going to be contrasted in a minute, just a minute with you. They say peace and safety. Just when they think everything is hunky-dory, things are going well, then the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And it's not just the Lord, it's the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is an extended period of time of calamity, of dangerous things. So that will come upon them as a thief in the night. Let's go on. Paul says this. He says, but you brothers are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Now, I'm going to take it off the screen, but I want you to think real quickly the contrast here. For them, it comes as a thief in the night. Okay, When they're saying peace and safety, suddenly destruction comes upon them. But then Paul says this, he says, but you... You are not in darkness, so that, the thief, so that this day should come to you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Paul is making a very strong contrast between them and us, between those people and the people of the Lord, between the people that don't know the Lord and the people that do know the Lord. And it gives us an understanding a little bit about this sudden destruction, this sudden destruction. Remember this series we are calling, we were calling deliverance and we're taking it from 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1 verse 10. It says where the Lord will deliver us, deliver us from the coming darkness or the coming of vengeance, this coming day of trial. And that's what Paul is saying here basically. Jesus said, See to it that you're not deceived. Remember the apostles asked Jesus, what is it going to be like when you come back? 
And Jesus says this, he says, See to it that you're not deceived. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Now, if you take a look at those verses and try to dig into what they mean, it means that for the elect, now who are the elect? The elect are the people that are chosen by the foreknowledge of God and by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. I had to look that up. The elect are those who are chosen by the foreknowledge of God and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. So it says for those people, people that know Jesus Christ, people that have been sanctified, people that the Holy Spirit has filled their life and they're waiting for the return of the Lord, it's impossible for them to be deceived. That's what it says. Jesus says, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, but it's not possible. It's not possible to lead astray the elect. We will not be like those that are waiting, having peace and safety and sudden destruction comes upon us. We are those that are children of the light. Let's continue. Verse 6, Paul says, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, Paul tells us that we need to be alert. This is something we should be waiting for. And you know, often the Bible talks about sleep, and it talks about sleeping in a negative note. You know, even the Bible talks about the ants. The ants don't sleep. They don't slumber. The idea is that the ants are industrious. They're busy, 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 busy. When the Bible talks about sleep, I put together a few ideas of what the Bible speaks of when it talks about sleep. When the Bible speaks of sleep, it speaks of ignorance. It means you're uncaring. You don't know what's going on. You are ignorant to the things around you. Sleep also speaks of being unfeeling, unfeeling. My wife recently had surgery, and when she had surgery, she had uh, anesthesia. And they gave her anesthesia so she would be asleep. And because she was asleep, they could do all kinds of things to her, right? And she didn't feel it because she was sleeping. Sleeping is being unfeeling. Sleep also speaks of a posture that renders us defenseless. You know, when I'm, when I'm sleeping at night, I found, especially when I started having kids, when I didn't have kids, I'd sleep through the night. You can have a firecracker go off, sirens could go off, I wouldn't wake up. As soon as I had children, all of a sudden my sleep habits changed. And as soon as I heard a noise, I would be alert. I would wake up. And I did that because I knew that if I was sleeping, we were defenseless. If I was the father and I was supposed to be protecting my wife and my children, I needed to be alert. And I can't be alert if I'm sleeping. Paul says that we, we shouldn't be sleeping, we should be alert. Sleep finally talks about inactivity. It means that we're like a couch potato. Things are going on in the world and we're not paying any attention to it, okay? The Lord is coming back. Some people are seeing the signs. These may be the signs, they may be not. People thought 50 years ago, 100 years ago, those were the signs. But we need to be alert. If we're alert, we're going to see these things. Paul says we're not of the darkness, we are of the day. I love it, it says that those who get drunk, get drunk at night. My mother, some of you remember my mother, my mother always said, nothing good happens after 9 o'clock at night. <laughs> nothing good happens after 9 o'clock at night. She wanted me home. She wanted me home at 9 o'clock at night. I wanted to stay out. I wanted to stay out till midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. She wanted me home because she knows that nothing good happens after 9. That's what Paul is saying. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night, okay? So stay sober. Stay vigilant. Be alert. Don't be sleeping. Let's go on. Verse 9, it says this, it says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, now this is a different waking and sleeping, we'll talk about that in a second, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And I want to start with verse 11. Therefore, comfort one another. As I said when I started, there's a number of people that teach this differently. That when you talk about prophecy, prophecy is one of those things that everybody has their own little path. There are certain people I love to listen to because I learn a lot from them, and other people I listen to and I say, yeah, they're not telling me much of anything new. Prophecy, as long as we take the Bible as our guide, I'm willing to listen to a lot of different people with a lot of different perspectives. And I want to be stick on verse number 11. We want to comfort each other. Comfort each other with the knowledge 
that the Lord has a plan for you. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would not tell you, but I go to prepare a place and I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself so that where I am, you will be also. That gives us great comfort, great comfort, regardless of how we understand the day of the Lord, regardless of how we understand seven years of tribulation. Does it actually mean seven years? Does it mean just a period of time? Well, again, I take it pretty literally, but it doesn't matter how you take it. Understand that the Lord has a plan for you. God has a plan for me. We take great comfort and encourage each other, understanding that the Lord will, have, will come back for us and has a plan for us. I left this up because I want, to pay, I want you to pay attention to verse number 9. Verse number 9 says, For God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. The wake and sleep refers back to what Paul talked about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 last week, or two weeks ago. We talked about the Lord returning, okay? For those that sleep in the Lord, meaning those people that have died, as well as those that are still alive. So whether we have died or whether we're still alive, okay? God did not appoint us to wrath. Now, the teaching that has become popular, probably popular with about 25% of the evangelicals, it's kind of hard to try to figure out, has become popular, is that the Lord will come back for the church, that the church is not destined to wrath. The idea is this, is that we are the bride of Christ, and you don't beat up your bride, okay? You don't beat up the bride. You don't, you don't have this wrath. And in the church today, those that take the Bible literally, the people that don't take the Bible literally, it's kind of hard to categorize them because almost anything goes. But, but people that take this as the word of God, okay, whether you take it every word literally or not, they kind of divide in different camps. And one of the camps is this idea that, that this wrath that is to come is not for the church, that God will come back, Jesus will come back for the church, okay? That's what we talked about two weeks ago, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, which is the idea is he comes back and we will be caught up together with him. That was my sermon title two weeks ago, caught up together. Um, that, that Latin word is rapture, okay? The idea of being raptured with the church. So there's a certain group of people believe that this verse also that says that God did not appoint us to wrath, meaning that God will deliver us from the wrath that is to come. However, there's other people that believe in what's called the pre-wrath. Have you ever heard that? The pre-wrath rapture. The idea is that the Lord will come back, okay? But it's gonna not be at the very beginning. We're gonna have to go through some of the problems and trials and tribulations, but not the worst part. That's called the pre-wrath rapture. There's other people that believe that that doesn't happen at all, that the church actually goes through the entire seven years of tribulation. Again, there's people that don't believe in seven years. So there's all different kinds of of nuances. I'm just teaching you what I believe, what I have come to believe, what I believe, what I have learned over the last 30, 40 years. This is kind of what I what I see. And it's kind of like, have you ever gone down the street and you've all of a sudden seen a, a grocery store or maybe a maybe a flower shop and you say, how long has that been there? And somebody says, well, it's been there for 30 years. You just haven't seen it. And you say, I, I can't believe, you know, I've gone by this corner for the last 30 years. I, I never saw that before. You mean, it, you mean it's been there for 30 years? And for some reason, you don't see it. Well, it's the same way with me. You know, 30, 40 years ago, when I came to the Lord, it was 40 years ago, I started reading the Bible and I started seeing this, okay, seeing this prophetically, seeing how this is how the prophecy lays out. And I can't help but see it. I turn to the Old Testament, I turn to the Old Testament, I turn to Micah and I turn to Isaiah and I turn to Ezekiel and I read the book of Revelation and I see these words of Paul and I see it just like you saw that flower story. And once you see it, you can't help but see it. Now other people don't look at it this way and that's okay. That's okay. And I think the best way for me to, to, um, to end this study today on the day of the Lord is, is to do two things. Number one, tell you that if you're interested in knowing more about prophecy, we can't cover it all on Sunday in, in 25, 30 minutes. We can't do it. 
if you're interested, I think after we do, after, after Pastor Hal and I uh, finish up with, uh, the, with the parables, I'm going to spend maybe eight, ten weeks and we'll talk about prophecy on Wednesdays at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. So if you'd like to learn about prophecy and you want, if you're interested in this, you have some questions, maybe you're coming from a different perspective, that's okay too, because we can talk about it, I don't mind, as long as we stick with the Bible. Not what Nostradamus says. I don't care what Nostradamus says or uh, anybody else. I only care what the Bible says. But two ways I want to close this. Number one, if you're interested in understanding this more, we'll be glad to talk about that in the, in the coming weeks. The other thing is this, is that Jesus is returning. We're not quite sure of the signs of the time. We're not sure exactly when that's going to be. There's no reason to speculate that. Bible says no one knows the day or the hour. Doesn't necessarily want to know the signs of the time. But no one knows the day or the hour. So to try to speculate doesn't do us any good. Understand that the time of salvation is now. Now is the day to understand who the Lord is. If you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life, don't hesitate. There's an old song by the Winans that talks about tomorrow. You know that song, Tomorrow? I, mean, I wish I could sing it because it talks about that I know, I know, but tomorrow. I'm going to wait till tomorrow because tomorrow will be a day that maybe I'll come get right with God. I'll find a time to be able to, to make my peace with God, to confess my sins, to make him the Lord of my life. But see, the problem is that tomorrow never comes for many people. Today is the day of salvation. So the Lord is coming back. You want to make sure that you're one of the people that isn't going to be caught unaware. You want to be alert. You want to be awake. You don't want to slumber. You don't want to be drunk at night, okay? You want to be able to understand that the Lord is coming back for you. So you need to be prepared. You need to have your heart right. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to talk about the day of the Lord.